Steve Hewlett is one of the country's most popular, funny and accomplished ventriloquists. He was a finalist on the seventh series of Britain's Got Talent in 2013. And he's on the line with us here just now. How are you doing today? Hi, Tony. I'm really well, thank you. How are you? <laughs> I'm very well, thanks. It's Toby with a B. You did it again. I keep saying Toby and it's does it sound like I'm saying Tony? Yes, that's weird. Toby, Toby, Toby. I am, I promise <laughs> you, I'm moving my lips. Yes, must be a ventriloquist thing. So when did you first realise that you had this talent for ventriloquism? And pronouncing people's names wrongly. <laughs> um, so when I was 12 years old and I saw a TV ventriloquist called Jimmy Tamley. He mm. won a talent show back then in 1987 was called New Faces. That was the equivalent of Britain's Got Talent. And I was watching this ventriloquist who lived five minutes from my house. Mm. And it's the only reason me and my family sat down to watch because, because he was local. And he was brilliant. He was funny. Uh, he had characters. I didn't really know the, the workings of a ventriloquist. I knew he was a comedian. But yeah. he had these these puppets and dummies and things. And I was so fascinated. I, the next morning after he won, because he won that grand final, and uh, he, Jimmy Tamley, I knocked on his front door because my mate at school lived opposite him. Huh. But you, you'd, now I know, being, being a cabaret artist, you don't wake people up at least till 11 o'clock because <laughs> that they work nights, you know. So, so I used to work, knock on his door about eight o'clock in the morning before I went to school. Um, I, I know now that he, he probably didn't appreciate that. Um, <laughs> and we we become a, like godparents to each other. So uh, he used I used to stay over at his his house, and he would let his kids jump on my bed at seven o'clock in the morning to get his own back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and did you come from a theatrical family at all? Not at all. My my granddad was a farmer and my dad was a farmer. So so they were, you know, I could have made all the animals talk if they stayed on the farm, but they yeah. they actually left when I was one years old. So I never really saw the farming industry. But I, I, yeah, so it's what those 12 years, we just had a great childhood. But my dad loved music. You know, my mum uh, loves comedy. So we watched loads of variety TV shows as a family, family of six, me and my siblings growing up. So watching all those variety shows, the Muppet show. And I love that poster <laughs> of the Muppets right behind you, Toby. Uh, yeah. That was Toby. I said, I guess. Yes. <laughs> and, and so it was just brilliant, um, you know, as a childhood. But when I saw this ventriloquist, I thought, I really want to try that. That That yeah. is amazing. And I was the shyest kid at school. I was, you know, like teacher's pet. They'd look after me because they knew I was quiet and shy. Yeah. So they were, uh, flabbergasted and my parents were mm. shocked when they knew I wanted to go on stage and entertain I would hide behind the dummies and you yeah. hear this it's a cliche you hear this with actors and impressionists and puppeteers we hide behind characters mm. and, and that's what we do and that's what I do yeah that's what I was thinking because on the one hand you are hiding behind a character and then on the other hand you're still yourself as well because you're playing two roles yes yeah I am an actor in a way and it's, I never thought I was and and then somebody probably 20 years ago said, because you do act, you know that. Oh, <laughs> I guess I do. Because I, I'm reacting to the characters and they say yeah. something to me. I get annoyed. I look annoyed. And then I reply to them in, in a, another way. And they've created that reaction from me, uh, which is me to begin with. It's very <laughs> confusing to explain. I've never had to, had to explain that before. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so I am an actor. We're, we're puppeteers, stand up comedians, actors. And there's so many you know components that go into a venture. Liquid act. Yeah. Now, when you went on Britain's Got Talent, you'd already been a professional ventriloquist for 10 years. And I think you've said before that it is a bit risky to go on a big show like that when you've already had a successful career because it could make or break you. Definitely, yeah. I had a few friends that had been on a few years previous that I knew of. Uh, Damon Scott came second. He was a puppeteer in, in the very first season. Um, and then I think it was Paul Potts that one he came second yeah. to paul and so uh, paul berlin uh also he came f fifth i think in the final uh th two or three years before i did 2010 so uh they, they warned you but they had successes you know i had two or three friends that done really well on the show yeah. i turned it uh, i was i was um, initially going to do a show called paul o'grady's got talent i auditioned mm. for that 
And and I went down really well with the four producers, but they cancelled the show and Simon Cowell bought the show because Paul O'Grady went to Channel 4. So anyway, yeah. so I went for it. So they have my name on file. So every year that Britain's Got Talent was on, I was asked to do the show. But once I'd seen the actual show go out, I thought, oh, I think it's I think it's more for amateurs. You know, so I don't... And I was a professional ventriloquist, so I thought, well, I'm not going to go for it now. Uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And so I turned it down on year two, year three, four, five and six. And then I started to see every year a couple of my cabaret friends, comedians and impressionists, magicians started to go on it. I thought, oh, hang on. They're they're now doing the show and they're actually getting tours out of it. Some of them are getting back on television. So I've got no other options. There's nowhere to go. I've been doing cruise ships, pantomimes, holiday parks for 20 years. I thought I'm going to have to just go for it. So I got a call in January 2013 the producer of BGT they said if you come on the show you could win the Royal right you know a place at the Royal Variety that's the thing really that made me go to the Palladium that week to do it mm. so they called me twice that week I said no the first time in 2013 and when they called me back again I thought you know what we just had a baby she was about six months old uh six or seven months Lola and and I had no work because I didn't want to go away as a new father so I usually after pantomime you do cruise ships so uh, uh, I'd just done Panto with Craig Revel Horwood and Anne Whittacombe in High Wycombe. Wow. And I had a brilliant time. But uh, And you're on top of the world when you come out of pantomime. You had a great time with Kudos back then. And um, But I didn't want to go away again because usually you do three or four weeks on cruise ships. So I said no to the ships. So I had a free diary. So I thought, okay, I could go and have a great night at the London Palladium and then think nothing of it. So I did that. I, I'd done uh, about six minutes on stage. I had a stand innovation. It, it went crazy. When it goes out on air, you watch YouTube, they show 20 seconds and Ollie Merz is singing over my audition. It's quite frustrating. <laughs> you don't have control on that edit, yeah. you know, but... I did do the show in the end. It could have made or break broke me, you know, which I, I have seen that in the past with mutual friends, you know, that, that have been on the show. And, and it's really sad that they have to go through that. And sometimes it's in the edit where they actually make you look bad. They can put, you know, bad reactions uh, onto the show yeah. and that weren't actually necessarily there when mm. you did your show, you know, so they can make you look worse than you actually went down. But yeah. I did go great. They just showed, you know, 20 seconds, and then it was up to me. So if I was going to get on the show, everyone was saying, don't worry, you know, because I was ready to watch that audition, you know, and think I've got a great six minutes at the Palladium. The crowd went crazy. <laughs> and I was uh, doing a show, a magic show at the uh, Wolverhampton. It, yeah, it was the football grounds. And we was doing a conference room. And my brother came with me, said, I'll come and watch BGT with you when you go out. So we sat backstage before I went on actual stage to do my yeah. show. My brother said, I'll go and get us a pint of lager. I went, yeah, I'll have half a lager and you have a pint. So he got us a drink each and and he missed it. I said, oh, Dave, you missed it. He went, oh, you're joking. I went, no, literally, it was over like that. It was 20 seconds. He went, oh, you're joking. We've been waiting six months for this. <laughs> and so it, although that was very disappointing, everybody would text me that night. I was, don't worry, Steve, if you get on the live shows, that's when you make it count. And that's what's now on YouTube. And so that's nine years ago now, yeah. long time. If it had happened earlier on in your career, do you think you would have coped with the exposure and all the success? I don't think so, because I, uh, with what I did get, I, I coped with it and I, and I loved yeah. it. You know, I'd done all the radio interviews and uh, other TV shows. I, I managed to get on lots of corporate gigs and stuff and, and meeting people, people coming to your shows. I booked a theater tour. We'd done 42 dates around the UK, my first ever theater show. And, and I loved all that because I love meeting people. My, my uh, passion really is making people laugh and, and just really enjoying the show business, you know. I have yeah. got a passion for the past as well. I'm, I've written a book now on ventriloquists. Uh, not ventriloquism. It's not teaching you how to do it. It's talking yeah. about the great ventriloquists that inspired me and ventriloquists that inspired them that inspired me. So it's, you know, 100 years of, of great music hall acts up until TikTok ventriloquists <laughs> to these days. You know? So that book... Um, so, so I guess BGT was my big break and now I'm kind of verging in different directions. I host a podcast called Eyes and Teeth. I, I've written a book which should be out in 2023 mm. and and I'm still out there performing and doing shows yeah. and variety shows and I'm back in Panto this year so it's all great. Yeah, well you've worked with the Osmonds and Ken Dodd and people like that. It doesn't get much bigger, does it? Well, they are two of the biggest names in variety around the world, you know. For the UK, Ken Dodd was 
god of variety and god of uh, the variety world. You can't get bigger than the Osmonds. They they work with on the Andy Williams Christmas show and they've worked all over the world. They were a big pop group, but they were variety, you know. The ventriloquists and comedians and magicians supported them for years. I, I'd done two years with the Osmonds and hearing Jimmy Osmond's stories with he worked with some of my heroes like Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys and because he was a great producer and a businessman, Jimmy Osmond. He worked with Michael Jackson and uh, on separate projects, but he also spoke about all the ventriloquists that, that he'd worked with over the years. And I was like, you're joking. You, you knew <laughs> Shari Lewis, you know, you knew Ron Lucas. And Ron Lucas was my childhood hero. He came over here as a ventriloquist in the early 90s and done four TV series over here. And, and I brought him back because uh, I befriended Ron Lucas. I didn't knock on his door because he lived in L.A. Yeah. Um, but I, we stayed in touch, you know, when I met him on his TV show. And then I brought him over to do a couple of shows in, in Basingstoke and Eastbourne. And we hung out for 10 days. He was one of my heroes, became one of my, my dearest friends. And uh, he wrote the foreword for the book. So, you know, we, we became really close to me and Ron. But it was it was actually, you know, just people like that that inspired me. And and I, yeah, I, I never forget that time they gave me when I was a kid. Uh, I now kind of pass that on, you know, to another generation. So how do you go about creating a character? I get so many ideas. People give me the idea. Give me, they're already written down. I've got a list of 100 characters I could get made, but... Um, you know, I I do lectures and talks on ventriloquists and ventriloquism, and I get a lecture from my wife if I have another prop arrive in the post. <laughs> so you can't buy every prop and idea out there. So I, I've had an idea for a, a guitar dummy. Rod Vegas is in my show now. He plays the guitar. I've had a dancing dummy, you know, and they all take technical um, sort of finances needed, you know, for those. So you, you have to put a lot of work into them. So I've got a lot of characters that I've kind of sit down and I think of a character. That would be a great idea. I can get it designed. So I email my creators. At the moment, I use Peter Pullen quite a lot, who created a lot of the greats. Um, or Orville the Duck, excuse me, um, Roger the Corsi's Nookie Bear and, you know, Emu from Rod mm-hmm. Hull. So Peter Pullen would uh, do a sketch. He'd send that sketch back and then he'd uh, I'd say, I love that. He would then mould it. He'd send me a picture of the mould and then he'd just make this character. He's maybe about 16, 17 characters over, you know, about 10 years. Wow. And and um, and so the character comes really, I don't really find a voice until the character arrives. So I sit down with the character, I look in the mirror and I think, oh, that that would be great. This would be great. This voice works or that voice. Works. Arthur Lager was quite easy because uh, I got an old man character and I just tried to make it sound a bit older than myself, really. So it was like, uh, hello, I'm Arthur Lager. No, no, I'm Arthur Lager. And make it a little bit deeper in the back of the throat. Yeah. Hello, hello, I'm Arthur Lager. How are you? Nice to see you. Hello. It's a little bit grumpy, a little bit moody. And, you know, it's a little bit more grisly at the back of the throat, you know. So that's yeah. where the old man comes from. Yeah. Which one of your characters would you say is your favourite to perform? I think Arthur, I've got a lot of freedom with him. I, I, I get away with a lot <laughs> using him. <laughs> I, I say what I want to say if, because I, I'm very easily distracted, but I use that with the characters. So mm. if something someone runs across the dance floor, I don't look at them, but my eyes have clocked them and I make the puppet look directly at them. So <laughs> it freaks the audience out. But I, I'm talking about something and I, ma- I make it happen where where the puppets stop talking, but I carry on talking. And then I, I can talk a load of gobbledygook, you know, while the puppet is actually staring and the audience clock it straight away. So and then the puppet stops me talking and then and goes for his, his victim, <laughs> you know. So it, it's yeah, it, I, I, yeah, I do love that. I, I love that sort of uh, reaction. You can use the characters um, so much, but I, I get away with it. So Arthur Lager is is great my wife's favorite nina's favorite is ponko the skunk ponko is more of a a muppet style character you know he's a skunk puppet quite a large character but he's very cheeky he's very naughty cheeky naughty so the kids love him and the adults love him yeah and i'm, I'm trying to rearrange his act at the moment and start afresh because he's been doing the same act for 25 years so <laughs> yeah i suppose it is quite important when the character might not be speaking to still keep them alive yes that's more difficult when you're holding two characters and i do an act where i do use two characters i'm very mindful of 
of the other one while one's talking the other one has to be moving as well you have to yeah. be ambidextrous you know you're, you're it's a ponga the skunk is talking and then how are you nice to see you and then the, the, the tiny tina the little girl character has to react to what he's saying so she can she can nod her head or shake her head while he's nodding or talking and and i do try and make sure they're always alive and there's this wonderful this is in the book by the way terry hall and lenny the lion way way before your time toby <laughs> but they 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 were um, wonderful ventriloquist acts, but when they would do pantomime, uh, the stage manager said, there's a couple of children would like to meet you. And Terry Hall said, please don't bring them in just yet. Just give me a minute. And so he would have to bring Lenny the lion to life before the uh, the children came into the door. So he'd put his, his hand in Lenny and make sure that he, he did not want the children to see the character with no life in them yeah. and no character, you know. So it, it was it's, it's very nice that because you're true to your work and your passion and your art if you don't ruin the illusion for the kids because the, the children believe you know these characters are alive and, and if you saw the muppets you know sort of lie in there i mean i worked on disney cruise ships and you'd be backstage i'm a big fan of uh donald duck Do donald um is my favorite and when i saw him lie in there before the dancers <laughs> got there to do the opening show on disney i was i was mortified really. <laughs> it, do it does break your heart when you see characters having a break do you know what i mean yeah. lying down but not moving you, you yeah. think i nearly gave donald duck and mouth to mouth i was worried <laughs> and so uh, beak to beak you know yes. so uh, you do have to keep your characters alive e even even if it's backstage you know if there's kids walking about i i, I try not to um l let them see it i remember what i, I was told about terry hall because his dear wife told me that he he would never see it. so i try and carry that on really in his honor because it's it, it is quite magic uh, keith harris was the same with orville you know he, yeah. he didn't want children to think orville was a prop you know and to me they're props though <laughs> Yeah. Arthur Lager's lying on the floor now. <laughs> you wouldn't see that. But if he's going to pop up here before we go, then you'll see that he's alive, you know. Uh -huh. Well, what would you say is your proudest achievement in your whole career? I always think of that. I always think of my children, you know, that because I'm very proud of my, my daughters and my, my wife is incredible. She's an incredible mum. And so, so, yeah, you would instinctively think uh, to be a father, you know. But you, you said career, so I'm going to talk yeah. about the career side of things. So um, it's Britain's Got Talent was a great thing, but that's that's what brought me to America. So I, I've done two years for the Osmonds. Uh, I wouldn't have had that YouTube clip. Uh, Jimmy Osmond wouldn't have phoned me and asked me to come to the States. Um, so, so I'm very, very proud of the Osmonds um, legacy. I've just been to see the Osmonds musical that Jay Osmond wrote. And to think I hung out with him for two Christmases is just incredible. But uh, what he has brought to the stage is, is beautiful. And I may not have seen the Osmonds musical if I didn't work with them, you know, but I, I kind of know that some of the brothers. So it was a beautiful thing. And I got that because of what I do. I'm a ventriloquist and I supported, you know, one of the biggest groups in the world. But it's that that is one of the things. So Britain's Got Talent has to be really the catalyst for that, because that that got me to the Royal Albert Hall. I supported Kenny G at the Albert Hall. Yeah. I wouldn't have done my theatre tours around the UK. I'm next year I'm touring another 20 theatres. Uh, on my third UK tour, which is an extension of this year, uh, at the COVID thing, you know, that, that yeah. stopped. So they, they're scattered all over the place. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for my 15 minutes on Britain's Got Talent. So I, yeah. th that is probably the proudest moment because the BGT stuff on those live shows were incredible. And I love sometimes looking back at that because, yeah. uh, you know, that was me and my, my, my <laughs> prime, I guess. But the proudest moment for me is when I released this book. This book is a combination of... Uh, of 25 well it is literally 35 years i this year is my 25th anniversary as a professional but mm. i've been doing it for 35 years that moment when in 87 when i um bumped into jimmy tamley and and so it does go back to 1987 when i started 35 years because all of the ventriloquists that i wrote to and and they wrote back those letters are going in the book so it literally has been a 35 year project so i wow. the most proud i'm ever going to be if i'm not here any more uh people can say oh you can get his book you know yes. his book is there 
and it will tell you all about his career and his connections with other ventriloquists, all of his favorite ventriloquists. And and yeah, it, it literally has taken me at least 20 years to write, you know, from scratch. But there, there's things from before that time that was all in the book. And it, it's just an amazing art, ventriloquism, because it was a dying art. But if you know people like Jeff Dunham and David Strassman, Ron Lucas, uh, Terry Fater, and, you know, Jeff Dunham, all those people there, they've made it big again. You know, they, they've they've kept it going. And, and the Britain's Got Talent franchise has um, helped that along as well, you know, because it's gone all around the world. Well, is there anything else coming up for you that you haven't mentioned? Do you know what? You asked me a question and I just reel everything off, didn't I? I basically told you <laughs> everything I'm doing the next <laughs> 10 years. But this, uh, I am starting to do uh, lectures on, but well, it's not lectures. It's a fun talk on ventriloquists. So it's to coincide with the book. So I'm doing them leading up to the book. And when the book's out, I've got something to sell at the end of the talk. But I talk about the, you know, the flamboyant lifestyles and the the difficult times of ventriloquists that had these amazing careers around the world and worked with Sinatra and uh, all, all of these these big people in Vegases and on cruise ships. You know, I mean, these days it's all on cruise ships. But now I, I'm so I'm doing these talks that are going to be going for the next couple of years. I really enjoy doing them. And it's the magic societies that are booking them at the moment. But I'm trying to open them up to the, the normal people that remember the ventriloquists. Uh, you know, it, you just sit down and watch the Sunday night at the Palladium when they was in their, their teens, you know, and now they're in the 60s and 70s. They're the people that are going to love chat, you know, but I'm trying to reach out to universities and colleges to teach them about this art of entertainment that is it, quite rare, but it's coming back, you know, quite, quite big as well. It's uh, especially in America, you know, everything's bigger in America, isn't it? Yes, certainly. Now, where are we able to keep up to date with you and send you fan mail and also fan mail to your characters yes you can write to us at the steve hewlett show.com so my website's up there you can email me through that website uh, it's all direct it's all me running it so it's the steve hewlett show.com and i've got a youtube channel so you the steve hewlett show you can go to there and look at loads of silly videos i've posted over 20 years but it's yes uh, yeah, so you can write to us there and you can come and see us in cardiff at the new theater in panto this year in mm. snow white and the seven dwarfs and if you're Ooh. a steps fan I'm with uh, Ian Watkins, H from Steps is uh, headlining with us. So we've got some great people there. I'm working with a dear friend, Mike Doyle as well. I'm very excited to go back to Panto, Toby, because I've not, I've not been to Panto for six, seven years. I've not performed in one for that long. And so it would be fantastic to go back because I love working with a family. And that's what you get uh, is in Panto is working with people that you, you become lifelong friends with. Yeah, absolutely. Well, many thanks for joining us today. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you so much, Tony Gribben. And and, and I, I'm sure I said Toby because, I mean, your name's right in front of me. So yes. if, if it sounds like I said Tony, I don't remember saying Tony today. But your <laughs> name is Toby Gribben and I'll make sure yes. I will always write that down as Toby and not Tony. 